Wednesday nights, um, we've been working through a couple of verses in the book of Ephesians. Those verses are found in Ephesians chapter 6. But one of the things that's important to know is that when Paul utters these words, and finally, my brethren, it is not because he just happened to get where he was getting. It happened that those were the words that he wanted to say, but before he could say those words, he needed to say a whole lot of other words. And so the whole book of Ephesians, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5, are all to get you to Ephesians chapter 6, and specifically to get you to the very last part of chapter 6, where it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. He said, as a conclusion of everything that I've said, I want you to get to this place. But he had planted seeds all through chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5 to get you to that final place. It would be like a movie, and you can always jump to the end of the movie, but at times the end of the movie makes no sense without the preceding parts that set up the movie. And so you may see someone being the hero, but they didn't start as the hero. You may see someone as being the individual that is, is, is the victim, but maybe they had victimized others. And so everything is a prelude. And so when you read those words, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He first talked and he planted the seeds of that in Ephesians chapter one and verse 19, when he said that you might know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. It's the first place that he mentions the power of God, that you might know what is the exceeding greatness of his power. Now, if you look that phrase up, exceeding greatness, it's a term that really the best you can describe it, it means to throw something so far that you can't find it. So let me illustrate. Cody, my son, played baseball in the best baseball teams. He ended up playing college ball and played on great baseball teams there. He ended up playing beyond that, and he played on good teams. But at the end of a practice, here's what a coach will do. You have to run poles. And what running poles is, is you start at home base and you run the right field pole, you run to the left field pole, and then you run, and you might run that multiple times depending on how many times you're supposed to run it. But there's one thing that can get you out of running, and that is if you can throw a baseball out of the stadium. So right before they run, they give everyone a chance. Can you throw the baseball out of the stadium? Can you throw it so far that you not only carry the infield, but you carry the stands and you carry it beyond? Now, depending on the field, if it's a college field, they may have you start at shortstop. If they're um, just a high school field, they may literally have you start at home plate. But wherever the starting point is, you've got to throw it out. And if you can throw it out of the stadium beyond, far beyond, then you're in a position where you don't have to run. Well, Cody was blessed with an amazing arm and he could do that. I've literally watched him throw the ball out of the stadium. I literally watched him do it at Rough Rider Stadium, throw it beyond everything into the parking lot because he was committed not to run. He didn't want to run until the coach said, stop running. And see, when it says exceedingly abundantly above, he says that you can do something that can't be measured. He says, I want you to know the exceeding greatness of God's power, a kind of power that 
the dimensions of it cannot be measured by anything that man measures by. It can't be measured by anything that man measures by. He said, I want you to know what is the exceeding greatness of his power. Now, that word power, as we mentioned, there are four main words in the Greek that refer to power. The first word that's used here, the exceeding greatness of his power, is the word dunamis. It's the word that is typically associated with miracles. It's associated with the unexpected, something that you don't think could happen or could ever happen, that it's even a possibility. And so God says, I want to show you a kind of power that can't be measured, that goes beyond everything that you think is possible. Dunamis. The explosive nature of the power of God. The exceeding greatness of it. And then he says, a power which is beyond measurement. Dunamis, which works. Another word for power. It's the word energeia. It's talking about working. So it's power that can work. It has an intended goal in mind. Today we got to see as storms came through that there was the power of electricity. That power of electricity is the kind of thing that it can destroy things. It can create collateral damage. It can hurt people. But the problem with that kind of lightning, electricity, is it's not controlled. What isn't controlled has no benefit. So what he says is, is that you might know the kind of power that cannot be measured by men, that creates possibilities, that things are at work, the seeding greatness of his power according to the working of his mighty. And then that word, Mighty that he uses there is the word kroktos. Some of you that play games, you know, you get used to hearing that name all the time. But it was a Greek word that was really ruling power. Referred to what a king or a queen would have. That by their innate position, they have power. And so, not the individual but the kingdom has power that's represented in the king. And so what it says is, there's a power that can't be measured by man, that creates possibilities so that things are at work. And those things that are at work begin to create authority, mighty, the might of a king, the might of a nation. It begins to create authority. And according to his mighty And then he uses the word power again, but he uses the word iskus. And iskus is refined power. And so it would be like having me stand up here next to a bodybuilder. There's immediately going to be a distinction between the two of us. I have a body and he has a body but his has been refined. So he has muscles where you're supposed to have muscles. And you're gonna notice those muscles because it's refined power. So in one word, in one verse, I mean, it says that you might know the kind of power, a dimension of power that you cannot measure, that mankind has no measurement for, the kind of power that just is so great that it creates possibilities that you never thought and it works with the intention that God's authority and the refinement of his power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. The greatest display of power was the day that Jesus walked out of the grave. 
the exceeding greatness of his power. But then he says, that power is to usward who believe. So people who believe in God, there is the possibility of living a life with the type of power that cannot be measured by man, that creates possibilities that people have never thought possible, and that it can work for a defined purpose so that authority and God's power can accomplish his will. If you spend any time thinking this through, then what you know is the amount of power that God has given to Christians to navigate life is so great that any problem that you may face is minuscule in comparison. There's no problem. That when you begin to think of what God's saying about the power that is to us who believe. It's just that we tend to believe in the power of the problem more than the power of God. Now again, Paul's setting up Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Because he's been planting this seed and he's been saying this strength is theirs. But then he goes over to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16, and he says that he would grant you according to the rich of his his glory to be strengthened with might through his power in the inward man. Strengthen is again the word kratos. See, if you were reading this in the Greek, what you find is this is like a dance but there's four people dancing. And he goes back and forth. He says, this kind of power, this kind of power, this kind of power. But he says that you might be strengthened with authority. But then he goes on and he uses the word might. And that's the word dunamis again. But he jumps back and forth and he just says, the kind of power that God's given you is the kind of power that comes because you believe in him, but it happens because you stay connected to him. Because you become strengthened with his power, with all might, by the spirit in the inner man. So he says, this power happens because you believe it, you believe in him, but then you're connected to him. A lot of people say, well, I don't have that kind of power. It's probably because you're not connected to him. You don't stay connected to him. You don't do the things to be connected. You don't live a life that connects you to God. No, you live a life that you believe in God, but you're not connected to God. And so you believe, yeah, God's God and he's my God, and I believe that God's God and he's my God, but you don't live every day where you're connected to him. And what God wants you to do is to not only believe in him, but be connected to him. And so if you believe in him and you stay connected to him, then this power begins to happen. Because people say, well, if I have all this power, why isn't it doing something? It won't do anything unless you're connected to him because it's no different than you walking over to a wall and there's a plug there and it has electricity in it, but you never plug into it. You can say, my phone's dying, and someone says, well, there's a plug over there, and you go stand by it. Standing by a plug does not give you power until you plug in. And see, Christians think that because I've come to church and I stood near the plug, then I have power. You get the power because you plug in. By his spirit, you're going to receive power because you're connected your heart to him. Someone says, well, how do I do that? Well, let me just say, 
For you to connect to him, you're gonna have to disconnect to other things. And most people are too connected to other things to ever connect to him. So you're not gonna do some of the things that other people do. You're not gonna say some of the things other people say. You're not gonna think some of the things that other people think because you're gonna stay connected to him and you're gonna connect to him and when you connect to him, there's power. And so he says that you would be strengthened with his mind through his spirit in the inner man. And so as you stay connected to God, you receive strength. And so after Paul's taught the principle of saying, this is what the power is, and then he's taught the concept of it's to us who believe, and then he's taught the idea that when you believe, you connect to God, and that power begins to flow in you, that he says, now finally, be strong. Be strong. See, through the series of thoughts, he gets you to Ephesians chapter six and verse 10. Let me just say, the reason we've seldom seen Ephesians chapter six work for anyone is we have too many anemic Christians. And so they lacked. It's interesting in the Old Testament, it talks about Joseph, Joseph who was thrown into the pit. Joseph that would become the ruler under Pharaoh, basically saving Egypt, but more than that, positioning Israel. I believe it's in Psalm 78. It says, and his ankles were fettered with iron. It says literally that they took iron and they put it around his ankles because he was a captive. But then... In the footnote, in the Hebrew, it says this. But iron was found in his soul. Most people don't have any iron in their soul. They live beat up and beat down. Life just beat me up. I feel so beat down. There's no iron in their soul. He's still a captive when he has iron in his soul. See, if the only day you can have iron in your soul is when you feel good, you have no iron in your soul. If the only day that you can have iron in your soul is when life is perfect, you have no iron in your soul. It says that when he was fettered, iron was fine. They're binding him on the outside, but God's creating iron in him on the inside. And see, you've got to learn to connect to God. Someone says, well, how did I do? I can tell you how I do that, but you have a different personality than me. You have a different life than me. What I know is the ingredients are the same. It involves time, prayer, and preparation. It's the same for everyone. It's no secret. There's no secret sauce. But I know if you don't do those things, you don't stay connected to God. And even though you believe, you don't have the power of God. And you can't get to Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So you've got to learn. And you've got to learn to take that journey. So Paul introduces us to a series of thoughts to get us to Ephesians 6.10. When we believe God's power and strength, which cannot be measured by natural means. There's no measurement for it. You can't compare any kind of measurement 
that matches the extent of God's power. And that that power is available to us when we stay connected to him. And we do that so that we can effectively represent him in this world. But then if you skip just a couple of books over, you come to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 11. And in there, Paul says to the church at Colossae, he says, be strengthened. Remember, he wants to strengthen you with all might. Here he says, strengthen with might. The word strengthen is the word dunamis. All might is also the word dunamis. So he doubles down, it's dunamis to the second power. According to his glorious power, Croctus. He says, be strengthened with the explosive power of God that creates possibilities so that you can live and exercise the authority of God. But then he goes on and he tells you specific, and this is the head scratcher for most Christians. He tells you exactly how he's going to strengthen you, that you would be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power with three things, patience, long-suffering, and joy. So how is that strength to usward who believe that happens when we stay connected to God and we are strong in the Lord and the power of his mind? How does it get displayed in three qualities? And patience and long-suffering and joyfulness. See, power is generic in its nature. It is specific in its operation by what gets plugged into it. So if I plug a lampstand into a socket, I get light. If I plug a heater into a socket, I get heat. If I plug an air conditioner into a socket, I get cold. The power is generic, but it's specific in its operation based on what's plugged into it. And what God says is, when you plug in to God's power, it will be displayed as patience. Someone says, well, what is patience? In the Bible, it's always one thing. It is the power to handle problems. It's what it says in James. It's the power to handle problems. But then secondly, he says long-suffering. What's long-suffering? Power to handle people. The ability to be able to manage relationships and people. And then joyfulness, what is that? The power to handle you. So he says that when this exceeding greatness of power, when I believe in it and I stay connected to him and I become strong in him, it's going to manifest itself in three ways depending on what I need at the time. It will give me patience to be able to ha have the power to handle problems when they come, that when problems come, I don't get thrown, I don't give up, I don't quit, I have patience to be able to have the power to handle the problem. Or it comes as long suffering, I'm able to manage and interact with others so I'm not losing my cool. Or I've learned to just have joy in my life and I don't let life take away my joy. So when Paul said, and finally, my brethren, he was reaching a conclusion to get us to a place that we would have the power to handle problems, people, and ourselves. And that's how you become strong in the Lord. 
And that is the first step in Ephesians chapter 6 to being able to execute the will and the plan of God. Is you've got to be strong in the Lord. Strong so you have patience for power, for problems, long-suffering for people, and joyfulness for you. Those three things. So it sets up the environment for what he's going to say next. Before he said anything, he said, you got to get in shape. you got to be strong in the Lord. 